That door reminds me of some of my 8th grade students. They just can't stop making noise. Oh. So Mark is, Mark has been teaching us about a Savior that, that relates to who we are, that can, can relate to where we're at, relate to our struggles and our frustrations. And he's come to a place where, where he's now talking about the pop quiz that happens. And as a teacher, I love quizzes. I love giving my students quizzes because they get so excited. Every time I say, hey, we're going to do a quiz, you can just see their faces light up with anticipation and expectation about the kind of stuff I'm going to ask that they didn't study for which I'm one of those gracious teachers, I tell them, your quizzes are open note. So if you took notes in my class, you're ready to go. They don't often take notes when I'm talking, but that's, you know, I can't make them do everything. And so, so Mark has come to a quiz, and at the end, there is a quiz. And the question that everyone must answer And it's not a difficult quiz. It's not one of those quizzes you get in math where it says something like, if Sally has four pieces of candy and Johnny has seven pieces of candy, calculate the speed at which the sun is going to rise in the morning. You've all had those kind of quizzes on math, right? Where you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. None of this makes sense. There is a quiz at the end. And every day, everyone at the end, everyone is going to have their day in which they stand before the Father and He quizzes them. And He's going to want to know, do you know who Jesus is? And you know, almost everyone has an answer to this question. Everyone who's heard the name of Jesus has an answer for the question. And everyone understands that this is an important question that they have to answer. And so everyone is almost everyone who's heard the name is prepared to answer of where they stand and why they stand, where they stand on who He is. I talk to people who don't come to church, who don't believe Jesus is God, but they have an answer. And I love it because so often I hear, you know, I believe Jesus was a great teacher. Well, okay, I can concur with that. Or I think Jesus was someone who loved people and gave his life to serve people. Okay, I'll agree with that. And they stop there, which is where I can't agree. Because Jesus made a point of going through his life, defining himself as the Messiah, claiming equalness to God in everything he did. And so I often ask those people, I said, well, if I'm teaching on a Sunday morning, and I claim to be God, what are the options? They're like, well, you can be a liar. Okay, that's an option. Like, you can be a lunatic. He's like, well, that's an option, and I may be that regardless of anything else I've said. <coughs> what are the other options? They're like, well, the other option's not possible. The other option is that you be telling the truth. Once you claim 
the things that Jesus claimed, there's only so many different options for answering the question. And you cannot, in good conscience, say, well, I believe Jesus was a good teacher. Unless you're willing to believe the things he taught. And so Mark preps us for the quiz. And so if you take notes, if I get to give the quiz, I will allow you to have open notes at the end when you have to take the test. I don't know if the Lord, the Father, is going to give you the same option, but you can say, Pastor Scott said I could have my notes on this. Is it okay if I check them? And, and maybe he'll concur. Anyhow, yeah, open up with me if you want in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 20. It says, Then Jesus entered a house. Then refers to the time frame shortly after Jesus has appointed the twelve apostles. Jesus has gone up onto the mountain. He spent the night in prayer. He called the, his disciples to him and he said, You, 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 and you, you twelve are my twelve. You are my inner circle. The rest of you can keep following me, but these twelve, these are the twelve. And so after he appointed the twelve, it says that Jesus then entered a house. It doesn't say what house. It could be Peter's house, because that's where he often went, was to Peter's house. But it doesn't say specifically. And again, a crowd gathered so that his disciples were not even able to eat. Everyone found out where Jesus was, and no matter where Jesus went, everyone began to follow. And if you remember from last week, Jesus, now that he's appointed the twelve, is beginning to focus his ministry on training up these twelve to take over for him after he does what he came to do. And so he's beginning to focus less and less on the crowds as time goes on, so that he can begin to prepare these twelve. So that he can make these twelve ready, so that they can follow on in the ministry and create a global change. And so Jesus goes with his disciples, the twelve and the others that were following him, and they go to this house, and so many people show up, so many people begin to find that where Jesus is, they begin to crowd into the house that they cannot even begin to eat. People are following from all over the place. They are coming from all over, from the Gentile regions, from all over Israel, from south of Israel, from the other side of the Jordan River, from Tyre and Sidon. People are coming from all over the place, not only to hear Jesus teach, but mainly because of the miracles that he was doing. Because they knew that if they brought Uncle Jim Bob, who hadn't been well for years, that Jesus would make them well. Since when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. This passage for me raises so many questions about what it must have been like to be one of Jesus' siblings. I mean, I would think growing up, most of his siblings did not like Jesus because he never got in trouble. Well, why can't you be more like Jesus? You don't see Jesus doing that, do you? And so they probably grew up with some bitterness and resentment because Jesus is the one who never got in trouble. But it also makes me wonder, how much did his brothers and sisters understand of who he was? 
Did Mary and Joseph tell the story of his birth? Did they tell the story of going to the temple and, and meeting Anna? Did they tell the story of having to flee to Egypt because of Herod? Or did they kind of keep those things hush-hush, not telling his brothers and sisters? See, this passage kind of makes me believe that they didn't tell his brothers and sisters all of those things. Probably because they knew that if they did, it would create a scene. Because, you know, once you tell your brother... Once your brother's told, oh, well, you see, your older brother is actually the Messiah. He's God in the flesh. Well, that's something you kind of go tell your friends. And then your friends begin to tell their parents. Hey, Mom, did you know that Judas' his brother, Jesus, is the Messiah? And then mom and dad find out. Well, mom and dad tell the rabbis, and the rabbis come, and the rabbis begin to make a scene about it. And so I'm thinking, based on passages like this, that this was something that Mary and Joseph were instructed not to tell the kids while they were growing up. Because we want to wait for the right moment to begin to reveal these things. And so, so his brothers and sisters don't know the truth. And then all of a sudden, Jesus begins his ministry, and they begin to get wind of it, that their brother now has people following him everywhere. And oh yeah, did you hear about your brother? He's doing this, he's doing this. And your brother said this? He said what? He said what? He said he was the what? He said he was equal to who? Like, alright. We gotta go. We gotta go. And how do siblings always respond? <coughs> wow. He must be out of his mind. I mean, after all, we've known him our whole lives. And so they become part of the group that on that day are some people, they're going to be crazy enough to say that Jesus was crazy. Well, Jesus couldn't have possibly been those things. I mean, you know, his brothers and sisters are like, you know, we've known him all our, our whole lives. We grew up with him. And yeah, he was annoying because he never got in trouble. And yeah, we resented him because mom always said, well, can't you be more like that? And I'm sure mom thought, you know, had I known they weren't all going to be this way, I probably would have stopped after the first one. Because, I mean, as parents, we think that sometimes, right? We're like, man, I thought they were all going to be this easy. And so, so they show up, if you could imagine. His brothers and sisters show up, and there are hundreds of people all around this little house crowding in, trying to get as close as they can to Jesus, and they're on the outside going, Dude, is this the same guy that we grew up with? Is this the same guy that worked those years with us as carpenters in Dad's shop? Who is this guy? Having completely missed the power of who he is. But it doesn't stop there. And the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem, and even though they went 
north, it's still considered down because Jerusalem <coughs> is higher elevated than this area, and so they had to go down. They said he is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. And it's amazing that some others are evil enough to believe him to be in league with Satan. But I mean, what else are you going to do if you're part of the religious elite, if you're one of the people who you believe is there for the purpose of guiding the people spiritually, and all of a sudden this guy comes... And he speaks in ways that you can't speak. And he does things that no one else has ever done before. You have two options. When you see the miracles. When you hear the teachings. You can either say, he serves the same God you claim to serve. And begin following him. Or try to deceive everyone by saying he's in league with the other person. And so they, the Pharisees begin to walk around and they begin to see miracle after miracle after miracle. And you notice that never once in the Bible does anybody question the miracle. Never does anyone say... I don't believe Jesus is doing miracles. <clears throat> Even Herod said, I want to meet this guy. I've heard his stories. I've heard of the stories of the miracles he did. I want to meet him. Because I want to see a miracle. The miraculous things that he did were never questioned. Nowhere in history are they questioned. None of the writings from this time ever question that Jesus did miracles. That Jesus did things that could not be done by others. That point is never in doubt. <laughs> So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. This idea is something we learn when we are little kids. That a house divided falls. Because what's the first thing we do? We go to dad and we ask dad a question. We say, dad, can I do this? And dad says, no. And so then we go to mom and say, hey mom, can I do this? And mom says, sure. And so we go off and do it. We divide mom and dad. Because a house divided cannot stand. It's something we learn from the youngest of ages. But yet this is what the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of being a part of. Jesus says, if I'm, if I'm in league with Satan, why am I casting his demons out instead of empowering them to do more? <clears throat> Jesus said, if I'm in league with Satan, why am I undoing the things that, have, that are here because of the curse that he was so instrumental in bringing? Jesus stumps them with a question. And then he continues. He says, in a, he says, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins of, and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, 
But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. And he said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. And now I always hear people ask, have I committed an unforgivable sin? And my answer is always no. First off, if you are concerned that you have committed a sin that cannot be forgiven, it shows that the Holy Spirit is convicting you. And therefore you have not gone too far. But I believe that the unforgivable sin was something that had to be committed at that time. It was committed by people who had rejected the Father. It was committed by people who had rejected the Son. And now in the midst of all the miracles, they were rejecting the Holy Spirit as well attributing the things that he did to Satan. And I believe it could only be committed at a certain time because Jesus had to be walking the face of the earth so that they could reject him as well as rejecting the Spirit after having rejected the Father. That's what I believe about it. If you don't like what I believe, go get your own belief. That's okay. Just make sure you can support it with Scripture. Scripture in so many places talk, talks about forgiveness and grace. That I can't imagine that something could be unforgiven. No matter how horrible it is, unless there is a set a specific set of circumstances at a specific set of times. Because I just picture my God to be such a gracious and loving God. Such a forgiving God. That He would not allow something like that to carry throughout all time. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him, and a crowd was around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. I love it. They get there, and they see the crowds, and they're like, We can't even get in there. How are we going to do what we came to do? And so they begin to say, Hey, let us through. I'm his brother. Hey, this is his mother. We've got it. Jesus needs to see his mom. Let us in. But no, I'm not letting you in, but we'll pass the word. And Jesus responds, Who are my mother and brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. You see, his true family know who he is. Jesus said, Who is it that are a part of my family? The people whose life has been radically changed. And you see, that's the beautiful thing, is that knowing Him is a life-changing relationship. I can't meet Jesus and not have my life totally and radically changed. I can't meet Jesus and not have His Spirit fill my heart and not have it make an impact in my life. And you see, that's the beautiful thing is the moment I met him, I knew my life would never be the same. And if you've met him, my guess is you won't need notes for the quiz. 
Because on that day when you stand before the Father and He says, why should I let you into my heaven? You just smile and say, because Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I know who He is. I know what He did. And I know it because He did it in my life. And that's why we sing songs and say, I want to shout it from every rooftop. Because we have something that is so amazing. We have something that is so life-changing that if you could imagine the God of heaven and earth pours himself out into each other. And he doesn't, he doesn't just pour himself out. He pours himself into us until we are overflowing. Allstate has a commercial where Mayhem is acting like a cat. And he goes up into the bathroom upstairs and he turns the water on. And the water begins to overflow out of the sink. And after a while, if you can imagine, this, the water begins to flow through the, the, the floor. And it begins to weaken the floor as it gets wet and eventually everything falls from up above. See, I mentioned that because that is what overflowing does. Overflowing begins to reach out and touch everything around it. Overflowing begins to move and pour forth into and onto everything around it. That is what overflowing does. And you can often tell the people who are in the midst of walking in the presence of the Lord because overflowing is all around them. Overflowing is out of them. That's why Jesus says in another time, He says that it's not what goes in that makes you unclean. Because out of, your, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. The things that come out of us are a result of what is overflowing within our hearts. And you can see it all around you in society. You can see it as you walk around and you hear the things that people say. How many people think that society needs to wash their mouth out with soap? How many people walk the streets and think, you know what, 30 years ago, people may have talked like this, but they didn't do it in a way they were proud of it. But you see, it's out of the overflow of our hearts that our mouth speaks. And society is speaking out of the overflow of what is in their hearts. And that's why it's important that the overflow of our heart is so pure and so clear. That out of the overflow of our heart we begin to speak about the things that Jesus does and the difference that He has made and the power that He has and the way that He has transformed our lives so that everyone around us knows that there is something better out there. So that everyone knows on that day when they have to answer that question there is a real good answer to that question and that answer is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and I know that He is because of the power that He has he shows in my life and the miracles He does and the change that He makes. And the truth is, is that if you are not in the midst of change and overflow in your life with the Spirit of the living God flowing out of you, it is not because Jesus has stopped being powerful. It's because we've stopped being present. And we 
we can all be honest and say we've all had those times in our lives where we do this and, and life is like a roller coaster and sometimes we are right in the middle of the overflow and sometimes, man, we're just quiet. And we're searching for where God is. And sometimes we're just on our knees before Him in a struggle with Him saying, Lord, this ought not to be. But I don't like the way things are. But I'm not going to tolerate the way things are any longer. And we wrestle with it. But I want to challenge you with where are you today? Because if you are going to stand before God someday and say, Lord, you should let me in because Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. There needs to be overflow. There needs to be excitement and passion. And even in the dry desert, as we as we hit those seasons where, where we're just wrestling with the Lord, there's still beauty in the overflow. As He fills us up. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, you know, I've said who Jesus is a million times, but I've never felt that overflow. I want to invite you to meet my Jesus. I want to invite you to meet him in a new way. Because he's not just a good teacher. He's God. And he came so that we might have life abundantly. Not sparingly. Abundantly. If you are not in the midst of overflow, I want to challenge you this week to fall on your face before the Lord. And just say, Lord, I want abundance. Because I want my heart to speak out of the overflow of my heart. And I want it to be you. And if you want to meet my Jesus, I just want to invite you to come forward and join me and talk to me after me. Because my Jesus will change your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we close today, Lord, may we do it knowing that truth, that you came to give life and give it abundantly, and that those that belong to you are your family, your brothers, your sister, your mother. And we all have the same Father. And we all have that Father who pours out the Spirit to overflow. And so may we live in overflow. And may it spill on to those around us, we ask. In Christ's name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week.